This podcast is coming to you on MPN, the Marketing Podcast Network. There's another show on MPM you might enjoy as well. I'm Gordon Glenister and I'm the host of Influence, the global podcast that shines a spotlight on the influencer marketing industry. And each episode, we talk to brand managers, agency strategists, influencer platforms, industry thought leaders and the influencers themselves about the latest trends and stories affecting the influencer marketing industry. And their stories will certainly inspire you. So just hop over to gordonglenister.com or search for Influence the Global Podcast wherever you normally get your podcast from. Hey there, would you recommend podcast advertising to your clients? Well, you're listening to this, so I'm guessing you would. But it's hard to know which podcasts have the best audience demographic or even number of downloads to make advertising with them a good investment, right? Not anymore. Podchaser Pro is the only one-stop shop for all podcast data and even contacts. You can find stuff like listener counts, demographic and geographic data, and even contact information for thousands of the top podcasts across any topic or industry. You can easily find lookalike podcasts, which helps develop a great media plan or even targeted lists for pitching new guests. Leveraging podcasts is super smart marketing and smart PR, which is why Podchaser Pro is the preferred podcast data provider of the Marketing Podcast Network. Learn more at podchaserpro.com slash MPN today. Podchaserpro.com slash MPN. Want Instagrammers and YouTubers to mention your brand? Or do you want to influence an audience to buy your product? I'm Jason Falls, author of the book Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand. In this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate the difference between using influencers and actually influencing. Welcome to Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. A couple of weeks ago, we had an interesting conversation about race with talent manager Joanna Voss. She represents almost exclusively women of color, though she is not of color herself, and most of her clients are of the Hispanic Latina variety. The natural next step in this conversation, for me anyway, was to dive deeper into the African American perspective, too. It just so happened that Lindsey Gamble reacted to and commented on the social content around that Joanna Voss episode. He is the Influencer Marketing and Innovation Manager at Maverick, which is one of the top enterprise influencer marketing platforms and service providers out there. So we hopped on a call and chatted a bit. Then I extended an invitation for him to come help us carry this conversation forward. Gamble actually sees the influencer marketing space from a few angles, and you know I like guests that have that varied perspective on things. He started out in the social media world as a hip-hop blogger. He built one of the more influential platforms for that topic in the Boston area after graduating from Bryant College, where he played football. Because he knew the content creation and social media space well, he wound up in roles at companies that wanted him to create content or connect with those who do. He landed at Maverick in 2018 and managed a set of client strategies. He's now in a leadership role where he gets to advise across clients on innovating in the space, which sounds like my dream job in a lot of ways. We talk about all that, but also get into the thicker conversation about race and influencer marketing. What impact did the social unrest and issues in 2020 have on the conversation? Is that swell of attention gone? Or are brands still pursuing making strides in that area? Is there a way to solve the pay gap issues between white creators and creators of color? For someone who works at a software and services vendor in the space, but knows the creator side as well, Lindsay brings an interesting perspective to the conversation. Before we get to that, it's time to get back to hearing more about how clients of our sponsor, Tagger, use that platform. Tagger is a complete influencer marketing software suite. It allows you to find, connect, and collaborate with influencers, execute campaigns, and measure success. We've been talking to TJ Ferreira, who co-founded Bubs Naturals, a health supplements company, about how he uses Tagger. 
So you you love the uh, ability to kind of pull data and analyze your influencers. I would imagine then that that probably uh, informs the the measurement and knowing what you get out of a campaign at the end, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is there is post campaign measurement that we have, and we check in on that um, quite often as we're running our monthly campaigns for branding content, etc. Um, we also have a number of metrics on the back end because obviously we're placing ads against that. We're looking for true ROAS, uh, true first time buyers, you know, repeat buyers. What is it? What does the retention rate on LTV look like if it's a warm, if it's a warm ambassador or warm influencer? Um, but from the front end, in terms of ease of use and quick and process, it streamlined all the data collection, all the decision making, and you know, again, truncated it to days opposed to a week and a reach out and everything else. So it's it's a more all inclusive for us. And then instead of tying three systems together, and those systems could have been Google Sheets and Instagram and you know and Facebook, and just having a human piece of those data points together, it really streamlines all of that. Thanks to TJ and to Bubs Naturals for sharing their use of Tagger. To learn more and get a demo to see if Tagger is right for you, just visit jason.online slash Tagger today. That's jason.online slash Tagger. And my influencer marketing podcast recommendation this week is the School of Influence. It's hosted by Amanda Russell and Neil Schaefer, both of whom also have books on the market about influencer marketing. Their interviews focus on how to leverage influencer marketing, but feature practitioners, experts, and the influencers themselves. If you like Winfluence, you'll probably like the School of Influence. Just search for School of Influence wherever you get your podcasts. We get deeper and more honest on race and influencer marketing. Lindsay Gamble of Maverick is next on Winfluence. This podcast is coming to you on MPN, the Marketing Podcast Network. There's another show on MPM you might enjoy as well. I'm Gordon Glenister and I'm the host of Influence, the global podcast that shines a spotlight on the influencer marketing industry. And each episode, we talk to brand managers, agency strategists, influencer platforms, industry thought leaders and the influencers themselves about the latest trends and stories affecting the influencer marketing industry. And their stories will certainly inspire you. So just hop over to gordonglenister.com or search for Influence the Global Podcast wherever you normally get your podcast from. Hey there, would you recommend podcast advertising to your clients? Well, you're listening to this, so I'm guessing you would. But it's hard to know which podcasts have the best audience demographic or even number of downloads to make advertising with them a good investment, right? Not anymore. Podchaser Pro is the only one-stop shop for all podcast data and even contacts. You can find stuff like listener counts, demographic and geographic data, and even contact information for thousands of the top podcasts across any topic or industry. You can easily find lookalike podcasts, which helps develop a great media plan or even targeted lists for pitching new guests. Leveraging podcasts is super smart marketing and smart PR, which is why Podchaser Pro is the preferred podcast data provider of the Marketing Podcast Network. Learn more at podchaserpro.com slash MPN today. Podchaserpro.com slash MPN. So, Lindsay, catch us up a little bit here on your background. Uh, tell me how you came to be at Maverick. Yeah, my journey is uh, unique. Um, you know, I, I went to college. I studied communications. I always had a goal to work in social media. Um, you know, my, my overall goal is to play professionally and I took it as far as I could. And, you know, that was a long shot. Um, so I didn't do any internships when I was in college. Uh, but when I got out, you know, I kind of wanted to just work. So I tempted a little bit and I ended up at Dana Farber, which is a cancer hospital. Um, so I worked there for six, seven years, uh, just to pay the bills and kind of get started. But on the side, I started a music blog called Hard in the Paint. And basically I kind of used that as my internship to really learn everything about social media, um, digital marketing, uh, writing, everything around the digital world. And so after doing that for five or so years, I was able to leverage that into an influence, influencer marketing uh, agency. Worked there for six months, unfortunately got laid off, but I, I learned a ton. I learned kind of the whole process of influencer marketing. Um, and then, you know, during my time of job searching, during being laid off, I came across a company called Maverick. Um, you know, it seemed similar to what I was already doing. It was a startup. It just seemed something a little different. They talked a lot about culture. And so I applied and, you know, everything worked out. And so uh, fast forward to now, I've been at Maverick almost three years or probably three years by the time that this uh, podcast is published. 
Um, it's been a great opportunity. You know, we're a one and all influencer marketing platform, so we're really in the pulse of everything creator economy right now. So you kind of backed into it by being a content creator as opposed to like, you know, intentionally going to school to learn all this digital marketing stuff, even though you did certainly learn it. But tell me a little bit more about that blog. When did that start and how big did you get? Yeah, I think it was uh, maybe 2011. So maybe a, maybe the year after I graduated. Um, you know, it was cool. I just kind of built from the start. I covered the local hip hop scene, the national hip hop scene. I was able to interview some major artists such as Ken- Kendrick Lamar. Um, a lot of people that came into the city, and, and that allowed me to, the opportunity to start throwing events, uh, doing some artist management, helping them with their careers, um, and then also kind of working with some brands such as Converse and uh, Skype and kind of acting as a content creator influencer, which I didn't really realize at that time. But, um, you know, I, I would say it was one of the p- pivotal websites in the Boston hip hop scene um, at that time. Nice. That's good stuff, man. That's, I mean, if you're interviewing Kendrick Lamar, I mean, hell, I would have just retired right there. Just been like, okay, I'm done. I've accomplished what I need to accomplish here. We can go sit on the beach now. Um, that's good stuff. So, um, you know, obviously you, you landed at Maverick. And so let's talk a little bit about Maverick. I mean, I, we've talked a little bit about it here on the show. Um, I know it's a kind of a soup to nuts, all in one influencer platform, but what is it about Maverick that makes you guys different? And what, ty- you know, what, what type of clients do you guys work with? Yeah, so Maverick is really geared towards the um, you know enterprise consumer brands. Uh, so we like to work with the large large brands that have several brands under them, and we really believe in influencer marketing at scale. Um, so it's evolved over my three years, but um, basically we help customers run influencer marketing campaigns, but you know social proof uh, campaigns, and we really believe in social proof. And so everything that we do with customers internally is all around you know social proof. Uh, what I think makes Maverick really unique is that. We support all the different use cases with influencers. You know, uh, some people just see influencer marketing as having content creators create content. Uh, we support ratings and reviews. We support you know research and working with creators to uh, get product feedback. We we um, have worked with creators and brands as consultants. But um, and then also along with that, we you know we see a lot of value in the different tiers of influencers. So everything from your, you know, your advocates and loyalists that maybe don't produce great content, but they're great at spreading the word on behalf of your brand to all the way up to the, you know, the, the macro mega influencers that are, you know, creating content for a living. That's nice. So you guys uh, don't subscribe to the one size fits all approach of, hey, let's just go buy a bunch of Instagrammers to hold your product, which is which is good. And and unfortunately, what some people do, but um so I just for this is a podcast and and people obviously can't see you, but just to make sure everybody knows you are African American and that's that leads the context into what I want to kind of touch on next. Um, I wonder for you, um, how have the social events of the last you know eighteen to twenty four months changed the landscape of influencer marketing? Because there there the issues I think are still there. Uh, but certainly the conversation about the issues has changed. How's, how are things evolved since you've been at Maverick? Yeah, I think the first thing is that there's actually conversation around it, right? To be honest, you know, in the first two years of my career at Maverick or even at uh, the influencer marketing agency before, um, there, was a, there was very little talk about D&I. There was very little talk about the social uh, events. Um, and I think, you know, last year and change, whenever the time was, I'm kind of losing track of time now. Um, that really created a lot of conversation. It really brought some issues to the forefront that um, really were relevant to influencer marketing, kind of what we do in marketing, but like a lot of times they aren't talked about. And so I think it was really unique, you know, working as an African-American in the marketing industry, especially influencer marketing. There's not a lot of people that look like me, at least from what I see. Um, And so it was kind of interesting to see that brands started to kind of really, you know, talk about it more. And it really felt like the first time that, um, people actually like knew that it had to be something that was uh, talked about. And so I think it has, it has a profound effect. And I think, you know, even today, even though it's not one of the major issues that you see in PR or on websites, it's something that everyone's talking about behind the scenes. Yeah. I wonder if the sudden participation of brands in that social conversation uh, last year, did that surprise you at all? Did it, did any of it come off as maybe disingenuous or was it a situation where you were like, thank God they're finally paying attention. <laughs> yeah. So I think um, it didn't surprise me if you think about the way marketing companies work, they always go where the attention is and whether it's uh, key moments in time or holidays or 
uh, you know, cultural events or sporting events. So like, you know, all the brains kind of gravitated toward this because it was pretty much you had to like say something. Um, but what I really saw that was interesting and not, not, I wasn't even, I was less surprised was that, uh, you know, a lot of brains stood in the middle where there was kind of a right choice or there was opportunity to make the right decision. And, but a lot of them really played it safe. And I understand it from a business aspect, but I thought this is one of the things where you can't play it safe. You have to kind of have a stance and, uh, you know, do what's right. Um, and so, yeah, I think there was a lot of instances where things didn't came off as fake or not really authentic. It was more so that they're checking the box. Um, and I, I just remember talking to my friends about it. Um, but what was really like, you know, interesting was like, I actually kind of cried about, cried about it one day around, I think it was the weekend that there was one of the uh, protests and riots and whatnot. And I can't remember um, exactly when, but it really did feel like the first time that the world kind of cared about African-Americans or minorities in a sense. Um, you know, we've, you know, I've always understood kind of, you know, uh, how things have been, but this was like the first time that people that didn't look like me actually stood up. Um, and so that was really unique. I think even like the people within Maverick and just people that I knew. And so it kind of felt like a changing point, not necessarily the solution, but like, okay, we're finally getting, you know, we're getting, we're taking a step forward where like the conversation's there and that's where you really, where you really have to start. Wow. That's a really it's really powerful to hear you say that, um, and in an, in a positive, exciting way, but it's also like devastatingly disappointing to hear you say that because it took until 2020 for this to happen. Um, but again, I guess that's my, that's my white guy reflection on things is God bless. Why, why has it taken so long? And I'm sure that, you know, you and others, um, who are black have probably been screaming the same thing for a long time. I wonder, I'm, I'm really curious. So, you know, the summer 2020 was, you know, this sort of linchpin moment in history. The Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, was around, but it kind of exploded. And then, of course, unfortunately, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, those things happened. Um, and at the same time in the influencer marketing space, the like the Black Lives Matter movement, the pay gap issue was there and people were talking about it. There were a lot of hand raisers, especially on the African-American side and the people of color side saying, hey, there's a play gap and we need to do something about it. But I think the summer of 2020 with everything that happened outside of influencer marketing really brought that pay gap issue um, and the diversity issue into the conversation at a very uh, much higher pronounced level of awareness. Do you get the sense now a little bit more than a year later that's tapering off or not? Because the problems aren't solved, I don't think. And I don't hear as many people talking about it as often and certainly not as intensely as they did a year and a half ago. But I wonder if there's a concern that we had this little spike and now it's just let's get back to the status quo. Yeah, I think kind of the the reason why it's not talked about as much is because we're kind of getting back to normal life. Of, of course, things aren't normal from the pandemic aspect but when you think about all those things that happened a lot of us we were stuck inside and it wasn't it was kind of like it was like the perfect timing in a sense of course the pandemic terrible there's not anything good about it but like i really don't think we there would have been conversation uh, around uh, black lives matter or even with those events if things didn't kind of slow down a bit and so now that we're kind of back up and you know it feels a little normal you're wearing a mask you're getting vaccinated you know there's of course this is still a big issue uh, people have kind of adapted to that life. And so I think the brands that really care about it and the, the, I guess the stakeholders that care about it are still doing what they need to do. But it's, you know, I feel, I feel like some people just kind of checked off the box and said like, hey, we kind of did our PR thing. Like we did that. Like, let's get back to business. Um, I, I think, you know, it's one of those things that's not going to be solved overnight. It's really like if you really care about the issue, um, you know, it's an always on approach. I think when it comes to the 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 pay gap issue is that that's not going anywhere. If you think about it, there's always an influencer, or a group of influencers that's calling out a brand or platform for paying them less, especially with the creator economy. Um, that's coming out even more. And so that's not going anywhere. It just kind of the conversation has shifted a little bit. Um, but I also think the events of last year empowered people to speak up. And they saw like, hey, if you have a voice, and you have a platform, you have some type of audience, whether it's small or big, if you say something, people will listen. And if you, if you um, say enough, uh, the people that you're talking to will have to listen because it's going to look, it's going to reflect poorly on them. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. So let's talk real specifically about the pay gap. And there's, there's a couple different ways that people interpret that. 
obviously there's the pay gap between white creators and, and creators of color. There's also the gender pay gap, you know, between males and females, which in some industries is actually upside down uh, from what you would think, you know, in the fashion style industry, I think some of the surveys and, and whatnot that I've seen women make significantly more than men. Um, but in others, it's the, it's the opposite and it, and it certainly shouldn't be. I wonder from your perspective on either the gender or the race or other gap fronts, what do you think we need to do as an industry to, to close these gaps and make, uh, pay more equitable for everyone who creates? Yeah, I think it comes down to maybe like three or four things. Uh, I think the first thing is just transparency, right? Um, marketers need to be more transparent about what they're paying creators for, Historically, influencer marketing has been like you pay someone based on their follow account. And so that's been the standard. And so someone has 100K um, based on that concept of standard, they're going to receive more than someone has a, you know, has a 10K following. Um, but things are changing. Uh, there's so many different use cases. Uh, a lot of people work with creators based on you know, getting content assets that could be uh, more valuable than just one post. Um, so there needs to be that transparency between the marketer when they're working with creators like, hey, we're paying you for your audience. You know, we're paying you for uh, uh, an asset. We're paying you for whatever reason it is and kind of create that conversation um, so that the creator knows that, hey, I might have this many followers, but this scope of work is based on me creating assets, which should maybe less than what would cost uh, what I would price for posting on my channel. Um, so just that transparency between on both sides, too, like how do creators price themselves? I think as a market, I always worry about that, too. There's a lot of different factors. So. That conversation around you know pricing and, and what you're willing to pay creators is the first step. I think the second step um, is uh, benchmarks, right? Just having more data around you know use cases. Again, going back to influencer marketing really being um, based around follower count and how people pay. Most of the benchmarks are around that. If you have 10k followers, you get this. If you have 100k, if you have a million, this is what you get. Um, but that data is very limited. Everyone's working off of different data. You know, Maverick has its own set of data. Uh, I'm sure your company has their own set of data. I'm sure, uh, you know, brands and everyone else has their own set of data. So what we're seeing is a little different, but the more data we can get around across platforms, brands, um, the better and across use cases. So what is the cost for an asset that's going to be used for paid media versus an asset that's being posted to the creator's channel? Um, I think the other thing, maybe most important is like more diversity. You know, the people that are running these campaigns are, you know, I, I'm I'm probably one of the few. I'm a I'm probably not only being African American, but being a male in influencer marketing. You know, um, it's 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 limited, and so platforms, brands, just everyone needs to kind of diversify the people that are uh, holding the budgets that are running these campaigns, so that they can be able to utilize their perspective when it comes to paying creators. I think for me, like you know, as being a, a African American, a, a black male, like. I'm always going to stick out for stick up for the people that look like me, but also the people that don't look like me. That's just, you know, otherwise no one else would do it. And so I think the more diversity you can have, the more perspective that you can have and the more that you're able to uh, rely on your teammate, whether it's a brand partner or at a platform to be able to speak up on behalf of creators that um, you, that creators that may be considered uh, underrepresented groups and, and whatnot. And so um, I think those are kind of the, the key three things. I think another one is just, you know, um, you know, creators are important. You know, when you, if you hire someone to do plumbing, you're not going to, you know, sh you're not going to short ball them. Right. Um, you're going to give them what they want. It's, it's all based on supply and demand. So there has to be that acknowledge of acknowledgement of creators, you know, being businesses themselves and they have their own price points. Yeah, that's very true. And I, I think a lot of people these days are doing a better job of sort of advocating for the, uh, you know, you're not just paying for the access to the creator's audience, you're paying for their time, you're paying for their talent. Um, I love the fact that, you know, when you were talking about Maverick earlier, you talked about, you know, sourcing influencers for, you know, product R&D and feedback. You know, how do how do creators price themselves for that? Is that an hourly rate? Is that a flat fee? And I think having these conversations you know, probably there might be an influencer listening to this that never even considered that they could be used for product R and D. And they certainly aren't going to price that based on how many followers they have. They're going to price that based on the time and, and, and energy that they put into that particular project. So, um, continuing to have these conversations is, is, is obviously helping. I wonder though, what role do you think that 
Maverick, uh, not specifically Maverick, but software companies like Maverick, sort of the vendors have to play in that transparency and whatnot versus maybe what the brands and and maybe even the creators and agencies have to play in that? I think platforms or even agencies that operate similar to platforms uh, really have can play a really strong role, right? Um, you know, working at Maverick, when you work with a platform, you get to work with hundreds of brands, um, you know, small startups all the way to the biggest of brands. And really you have that opportunity to, you have so many different touch points to educate your, your customers and um, really kind of be the voice of the creator and be the voice of the marketer at the same time. And because those brands are hiring you for a service or tech, whatever it is, they're already looking for you, looking towards you for expertise. So you're already teed up. It just really takes a marketer that's really confident um, to be able to like share, you know, those insights and be able to flag, um, you know, things around DNI or things to that could be sensitive and things that could impact brand safety. And some brands are gonna, you know, say, hey, thanks, but we still want to do this way. This way, and that's totally fine. But at least you kind of you kind of let them know, hey, like if you do this type of campaign or this language, or you know, you offer creators this, like this is what could happen based on other scenarios or just based on you know, um, you know, best practices. And so I think we have probably the most, um, we can have the most in- influence in the industry because we get to touch so many different aspects of it, especially on the creator side too, right? We're not only work with brands, but we're briefing creators and we can kind of have those conversations and gather that feedback, whether it's through a, a survey or just informal conversation. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about your role at Maverick, because I was really fascinated when you were describing this to me a couple of weeks ago when we were talking, I was like, Jesus, that sounds like my dream job. Um, so give me, give me, give us a little bit more insight in what your day-to-day role is within sort of the innovation space there at Maverick. Yeah. So my, my role is really a jack of all trades. Um, it's focused around innovation and really allows me to touch different parts of the business. So previously for the first two years of my Maverick career, I had a book of business. I was helping brands execute influence marketing campaigns, providing strategy, you know, similar to like an agency uh, role, like strategist. Um, and Maverick was great enough to, uh, allowed me to move into this role, which they built based on a need for the company, but also my passion points. Um, I love looking at, you know, big trends and seeing how they impact influencer marketing, social media, and everything else along those lines. And so my role is really focused on keeping Maverick at the forefront of influencer marketing. Uh, So supporting our internal teams and our customers and helping them uh, execute campaigns on different platforms and different influencer marketing use cases. Uh, So, you know, Twitch, um, not necessarily new, but something that marketers are still trying to figure out. Um, mm-hmm. You know, bringing paid media into the mix with influencer marketing and, and amplifying content, uh, affiliate marketing. You know, not necessarily new, but the in- intersection of affiliate influencers is something that's definitely picked up. Um, so, along with that, also building out the the process, the best practices, the internal documentation, um, and then thought leadership. But it's really cool. I love it. The day to day is a little different. Sometimes it might just be working on resources. Uh, sometimes I might get pulled into, you know, uh, not an issue, but a potential opportunity and kind of, you know, provide knowledge around that and potentially a, a path forward, but also maybe lead that in terms of figuring it out. And so it's a lot of, it's challenging. It keeps me, sometimes it keeps me up at night as far as just trying to figure out, you know, find the solutions to problems. Um, but I, I really like it. It allows me to kind of uh, utilize the skills that, uh, the things that I think I do well. That's very cool. And I, I love the fact that, you know, part of what you're you're doing is, um, you know, sort of observing what's happening out there, coming up with really cool ideas that you pass along to your account team and also kind of keeping them abreast of, you know, what the 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 what the, the trends are in terms of what creators are doing that might be new and innovative. So I wonder, you know, if you can if you look out there over the course of the next, let's say, six, 12, 18 months, um, you know, what's changing in terms of the influencer partnerships and creativity? What are what are brands and and or uh, creators doing from a collaborative standpoint today or what will they be doing in the next few months that's going to be new and different that we can look, look out for? Yeah, I think the first thing, it's not necessarily new or different. And I think most people have noticed, but I think a lot of influencer marketing is uh, going towards being more creator led. So, you know, as marketers, we typically give a creator a brief and say, hey, you say this and that and cover these checkpoints. And while that's really important in terms of branding and, you know, making sure you get the, the product guidelines based on your product or service. Um, but we're realizing creators, creators know their audience best. And so I think there's going to be more uh, flexibility for creators and more marketers allowing creators to take their, uh, their product or service 
and figure out how they can integrate it in their content and their lifestyle in a way that that is more authentic and connects with that audience since they taking the years and time to build up that audience, right? And so I think um, there's going to be a little more flexibility. Uh, one thing also is just the different use cases for creators too. Like historically, a lot of people are just activating creators on Instagram and TikTok now to create content and include messaging. I think people are going to kind of work with creators a little more um, outside this the realm of content creation. Um, so bringing them in for research, bringing them in for product feedback, you know, even bringing them on board as consultants and advisors. We already, I think this past week, I can't remember the exact examples, but there's been so many creators that have uh, been hired for, you know, uh, director, you know, creative director roles or, uh, you know, chief creator officer. And so they're being able to leverage their, their content creation ability, their ability to really, you know, create an audience um, into nine to five gigs and really executive gigs, gigs if you think about it. So um, I see more of that and I just see um, the industry continue to evolve and I see the uh, everyone becoming a creator, right? Like everyone's a creator already, but just that amplifying as more people realize that no matter what you can do, there's a way to kind of, you know, share that with the world. There's a way to monetize it, whether it's through brand partnerships, whether it's, you know, through a community subscription, whether it's through selling product. And so more people are going to be able to, you know, have these little side gigs or even full-time gigs as a creator. Um, I would say, so those are the main things I see. Um, and then me, me and Maverick CEO, Lyle, were actually talking about this, and this kind of goes back to one of my earlier points. Um, if you think about any problem that a marketer or a brand has, you can really take a creator and like plug them into that. Um, and one of the great examples that he used was like customer, customer service. And so, you know, you go to a site, you want to figure out like, hey, I need help with this product. I need help with this. Or like, I want to, I want this type of product. Um, you could, there could be a creator or a group of creators on the other side that kind of function as customer service and use the expertise to, uh, you know, guide you to the right product or service or to provide feedback. And so there's so many different ways that creators can be used. And I think the brands that bring creators deeper in their business, whether it's bringing them on board full time or just having them an extension of their team are going to be the ones that stand out. They're going to be the ones that, you know, shake up the industry, make noise and do things that us marketers um, that aren't doing because, you know, we're so, we can be so narrow minded and like taking a brief and, you know, straight KPIs and all those different things that we're not always able to think outside the box, especially when it comes to an agency uh, type role. Right. Yeah. I I would love to have, uh, especially for, the emerging platforms where, you know, traditional advertising creatives may not necessarily have a lot of experience uh, in create, certainly not in creating for, but, you know, also probably don't have a lot of experience playing on them, but like, you know, Twitch and TikTok and, and some of these emerging platforms, even Snapchat still, I would love to have a creative director, um, you know, uh, on, on staff at Cornette who that's why we hired them because they know how to create in these emerging platforms. And I wouldn't even care if they went to art school or if they had, you know, a a book of uh, a portfolio of all the ads that they'd worked on. I'd rather much, you know, have them say, just go to my TikTok page and see all the bazillions of, uh, you know, followers and engagement and whatnot I have because I know how to create in these platforms. Um, I think that could be, you know, a job description of a creative director, art director, copywriter type person of the future. So, I would say one more thing too is um, in terms of creators, I see like creators moving a lot more towards these own audiences. And so right now with the social media platforms changing and algorithms, and I think even as a small time creator, you know, share, you know, work with some brands um, within the outdoor space, I get frustrated too, because engagement's shot, you know, people aren't seeing the content. And so I think a lot of creators are getting frustrated with the algorithms and just how often those things are changing while they're keeping engagement up for the average user and for the platforms. They're not always, super friendly for the creators. So I'd see a lot of creators moving into newsletters, podcasts, websites, and kind of going back to um, channels or moving towards channels that allow you to really own that audience and that communication and that, and audiences that are really engaged. Like, you know, you the people that listen to your podcast, like they opt in to listen to it. It's not so much as coming through a news feed. And so they're not only the right audience, but they really care what you say. And they're going to probably care a little more than someone that just scrolls through a news feed and comes across a piece of content. Spoken like a true blogger. Own your, <laughs> own your content. Yeah, I, I, we've 
we've we've talked about that. In fact, I think I had a, a, a commentary, you know, a episode a few episodes ago where I basically said that I think the, the this trend is going to happen that with the you know the OnlyFans controversy and the you know Facebook uh, constantly being weird and now getting even more weird with the metaverse, um, <laughs> I, I think that you're going to see a lot more creators be like, hey, let's let's put some. Let's put some content on this website or on this blog. Let's do an email newsletter. Let's start to own not just the content, but the audience as well. And uh, I think that's going to open up um, the door for a lot of um, what I would consider kind of old school influencers, the bloggers and the podcasters and the email you know, marketers uh, to kind of maybe have a little bit of a comeback, especially uh, in the B2B space but maybe also in B2C as well. Lindsay, man, this has been a great conversation. Where, where can people find you online if they want to connect? Yeah. Uh, all things, Lindsay Gamble. So that's Lindsay with an E, not an A. Uh, I love connecting with people on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. It's Lindsay Gamble underscore Instagram, Lindsay Gamble underscore. Um, but yeah, I love connecting people in the industry. Happy to, you know, chat, you know, provide guidance, whatever it is, connect to your ideas. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out. Well, let's don't miss the opportunity to also send people to maverick.com. That's M-A-V-R-C-K.com because it's a heck of a platform too. Lindsay, man, thanks so much for the time today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast is presented by my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my monthly newsletter or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening. And remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. You've been listening to the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.